Good afternoon from the um, Washington, D.C. office of Wagner Law Group. Um, my name is Mark Poerio. Um, I'm an executive comp attorney with the firm, and I'm fortunate to be joined by my partner, Dan Brandenburg, also of Wagner Law, as well as James Wynn of Quat Associates. Um, as we focus today on tax-exempt organizations and their governance of executive compensation, I thought it would be helpful to get started with a little bit of background, um, and I'll invite um, James to go first and tell us a little bit about Quat Associates, and then we'll go to Dan next. James? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Uh, Quad Associates is based in Washington, D.C. We're a management consulting firm uh, that works exclusively with nonprofits, and we work throughout the country in, in each of the nonprofit sectors. Uh, we focus primarily on executive compensation, uh, staff compensation, performance management, and strategic planning. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, I'm, I, I'm a principal with the firm, and uh, because of my background and uh, experience in exec comp, that's where I spend most of my time and on the uh, opinion letters and 4958 compliance that you'll hear more about. Hi, Dan Brandenburg. Um, I've spent most of my career uh, working with tax exempt entities on uh, both retirement plans, life insurance plans, uh, executive compensation, and also split dollar plans over the years. Uh, and uh, I still do a lot of work on that area. Uh, and have been following and working with people on some of the same topics that we have we're talking about today. Mark? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Yeah, I mean, um, I know Dan has more years of experience than I have, but I've had 30 years at this point, um, and it's been heavily weighted to executive comp, um, both private, um, for-profit as well as not-for-profit, and then with a significant amount of governance work, both um, in the context of being on charitable boards or counsel to the boards. Um, or advising them about um, startup structures and tax issues. So we think we can cover the landscape here. One thing to keep in mind, um, there's a lot of material, even though we don't have very many slides, we could spend a day on what we have here. So we want you to know this is intended to be an overview. We're going to try not to go too deeply into the weeds, but on this first frame you can see we've got our phone numbers and our emails. So. If you go through this call and you have questions of any kind, you're welcome to reach out to us, and we'll be glad to fill in um, the backstory in terms of what we have here today. So with that, um, we'll move to the next frame. Yeah, and to get us started about um, you know, this universe we're in, what we wanted to do as we approach this is to start with, you know, what, what are the broad parameters in terms of the laws and this, including the tax laws that we deal with? And then once we cover that, we'll have plenty of time to talk about practical applications um, that we encounter. Um, you know, if you look at this first bullet, when it comes to governance for whether it's for-profit or not-for-profit, there are similar duties at the board level. You've got board members being responsible for general oversight, major decisions, and having fiduciary duties for their organizations. I think when we turn to the not-for-profit context, we have two pieces, too, that are even more complicated. Um, one of them is just the importance of the mission of the organization. And, you know, so in, in a corporation where all you have to do is watch profit, that's straightforward in that sense, but a not-for-profit has a broader mission than just watching the bottom line. Um, so that's something that we want to emphasize as a difference. And then also, when you're on a not-for-profit board, and especially to the extent there are volunteer boards, you know, it's always a matter of what is the role of the board? Are they fundraisers? Are they rubber stamps? As we get into what we have today, we're going to talk about one of the tougher challenges because executive compensation decision-making at the board level is critical for retaining the right people and um, you know, structuring it in a way that um, advances the mission of the organization. Um, I think it, when it comes to governance, you know, the starting point in a very general sense is the articles and bylaws. Um, they will usually identify particular roles um, as well as committee structures. Those need to be honored. Essentially, anything that's in place needs to be followed. So whether it's a compensation committee that's been structured with a charter or a delegation in some way of authority, boards need to be very careful about that. There's also governance-related disclosures that you'll hear more about. 
but you know whether it's on a website or in resolutions that um, are internal or in Forms 990, like James will talk about shortly, um, boards are actually creating a record and they're accountable for the record. Whenever we encounter litigation in the executive comp area where someone is saying that a board hasn't done their duties properly, it's the written records, whether it's the IRS or anyone else looking. So being smart about those records is critically important. And then finally, the other thing, you know, as we talk about what's at stake today, there is the personal liability of board members, always a concern. Um, state law um, governs that in general. And, um, you know, by and large, there's something called the business judgment rule that gives great deference from the courts to the, the decisions of a disinterested or independent board. But independence, as you're going to hear, is very critical in the not-for-profit context. But beyond that, um, we also have um, federal tax laws and risks there because when you're working for um, a tax-exempt organization, there's a mission that's been approved, there are purposes um, that need to be observed, and as a simple example, um, if donations are received, they need to be used for the purpose that they were received for, and a board is ultimately going to be accountable for um, that type of proper steering of the organization. Uh, when it comes to executive compensation, you know, we'll be talking more, but the IRS has published guidance that says that, you know, reasonable compensation is what's allowed and allowable, and how a board gets there is what we're going to talk more about. And then finally, um, you know, as we talk about the mission, you know, you also have situations where a board can get challenged by, you know, for example, are there revenue constraints that come up, or are donations down, or did you lose a grant? And those create pressures that we've had to work through at times. So overall, as a board puts together executive comp structures, they want to be looking at customizing what's, on, what's provided and what's committed to be provided to fit its goals and its future direction. Dan, do you want to work from there? I'm going to talk about excess benefit transactions and rebuttable presumption. I'm going to start a little bit backwards. So I'm going to talk about more of the uh, rebuttable presumption and then talk about the penalties. In the meantime, since James spends a lot of his work justifying these types of arrangements, I'll also ask James to speak up. But the organization meets fo the following three requirements. Payments to a disqualified person under a compensation arrangement presumed to be reasonable and a transfer of property or the right to use property is presumed to be at fair market value. The three requirements for establishing the rebuttable presumption are compensation arrangement must be approved in advance by an authorized body of the applicable tax-exempt organization, which is composed of individuals who do not have a conflict of interest concerning the transaction. Prior to making its determination, the authorized body obtained and relied upon appropriate data as a comparability, and the authorized body adequately and timely document the basis for its determination concurrently with making that determination. I mean, one of the things that we'll, you'll see over and over again throughout this presentation is wind up documenting, documenting, documenting. If I could uh, uh, pick up sort of a, a summary of what the uh, documentation that's necessary and let James pick up afterwards. The documentation the authorized body should include the terms of the transaction and the date of its approval, the members of the authorized body present during the debate and vote on the transaction, the comparability data obtained and relied upon the actions of any members of the authorized body having a conflict of interest, and documentation of the basis for the determination. The Internal Revenue Service may refute the presumption of reasonableness only if it develops sufficient contrary evidence to rebut the probative value of the comparability data relied upon by the author, authorized body. And if the organization does not satisfy the requirement, the rebuttal presumption of facts and circumstances approach will be allowed. I mean, one of the things, and it, this is probably more true of communal organizations and religious organizations, at one time it may have been an honor to be on a board. Today it's a very responsible position and a very necessary position, but I constantly counsel people, both clients and friends, get on the board only if you plan to be involved and take it seriously. I mean, I've been at least on one board where lifetime memberships were involved, and every time there was a controversial element, they literally trot people out, uh, not trot, but wheel people out in wheelchairs and walkers. I mean, I, uh, uh, that's not the model I suggest. Yeah, you know, from uh, our perspective as uh, compensation consultants, we come in and help boards 
uh, check that box on the Form 990 that they had an external review by a third party, and we issued an opinion letter that compensation is reasonable. A lot of our methodology and approach to it is actually informed by the college and university study the IRS did, I think, in 2013, 2014. And in that study, it was interesting that the, the IRS really focused on not that you used survey data and that it was just colleges and universities, but were those the right subgroups of colleges and universities? You know, did those organizations reflect the same traits as yours? In the college and university context, there, it's actually, there's a decent universe there of uh, like institutions you, you can pick out. But for many of our clients, and I'm sure many of uh, Mark and Dan, uh, the first thing we hear when we walk in is, we're unique. There's no one like us. And you know what? They're, they're usually right. So the, the first effort is really defining that marketplace. Who are your peers? And, you know, why do you look at them as peers? Uh, thinking about it in that way can be very helpful. And then just recognizing that, you know, the median of a group, the 75th percentile, the IRS isn't hung up on that. That's not, there's not a hard cap that you can't go over the 75th, but it's, you know, how do you look in relation to the factors of the group and the scope factors? Unfortunately, where we do quibble with the IRS is they take a fairly black and white approach to revenues, expenses, location. Those are typically the, the factors they look at, and we add a little bit more nuance to it, you know, the tenure of the CEO, performance. But you know, on this slide, I think the focus here is on the, you know, the compliance and the disclosure piece. And one thing I want to emphasize that we've seen is a shift in the last few years of using the Form 990 and other disclosures as an opportunity rather than a threat. You know, let's get out in front of our message. Let's use that as a communication tool. Uh, because you have a lot of different stakeholders who are looking at your 990s, uh, you know, your donors your own staff members, other executive team members kind of want to see how they stack up against others. Uh, so get in front of the message, involve your communications professionals, especially if there's something coming down the line. Uh, and I always focus on onboarding board members, you know, present the compensation to them before they see it from somewhere else. Uh, so I, I think those are the, the primary focuses. But with all this data out there, uh, you know, there needs to be a focus on total compensation. And if we go to the next slide, uh, the, the, the tax strategy slide, I think what we're talking here about is kind of that additional compensation that has been the focus of nonprofits in recent years, uh, specifically deferred compensation. So when we think of comp and on the 990, when we think of comp, there's a base salary category, you know, what you're paid in salary every week. Total cash compensation, which reflects base plus bonus, and then uh, other benefits, retirement, and deferred compensation. So the the way I define uh, deferred compensation is a compensation arrangement that defers pay tax-free until a future date, usually retirement or the end of a contract term. Uh, you know, Dan's going to go in more detail about each of the the plans. Uh, but I do want you to note that they're becoming increasingly common, and among major nonprofits, the larger ones, 89% uh, have some form of deferred comp, and, and they're important to keep up with market just to be competitive. Uh, they're important tools for retention, helping executives set aside money for future needs, or to make whole for kind of caps on the, the qualified plan. So I'll stop and uh, turn it over to talk about the weeds, and the, or not the weeds, the <laughs> details uh, of deferred comp and the rules that you have to uh, comply with. Let me go backwards a little bit and talk about what happens if you screw this up. Uh, there's a 25% of the excess, there's a tax of 25% uh, of the excess benefits imposed on the excess benefit transaction between the tax exempt organization and the disqualified person. If the 25% tax is imposed and the excess benefit is not corrected, there's a 200% tax on it. And to avoid the 200% tax, a disqualified person must correct the excess benefit transaction during the taxable period. The taxable period begins on the date the transaction occurs and ends on the earlier the date the statutory notice of deficiency is issued or the Section 4958 taxes are assessed. And the 200% excise tax may be abated in the excess benefit transaction subsequently 
if corrected during a 90-day correction period. I mean, there's a lot of – my first suggestion, people, is don't screw it up. But if you do, the, if you pay attention, there are a lot of ways to fix it. Unfortunately, there are a number of situations which get a lot of publicity. I'm not sure how often they happen, but certainly get a lot of publicity where people just don't want to hear about it. And they're very stubborn and they have uh, uh, larceny in their hearts. Pardon me, coining a new phrase. <laughs> uh, there's also an imposition of the excise tax on organization managers. And it, there's a 25% tax imposed on disqualified person, the organization manager, who knowingly participated in the transaction, the manager's participation was willful and not due to reasonable cause, and there's joint and several liability for the tax. Uh, the person may be taxable for both the tax paid by the disqualified person and the organization manager tax in appropriate circumstances. The excise tax is a 10% excise tax with a cap at $20,000. Uh, the other piece is, and, and even though there's usually a lot of pressure not to speak up, there's some economic uh, benefit to the individual who does speak up, and that an organization manager is not considered to participate in an excess benefit transaction where the manager has opposed the transaction in a manner consistent with the fulfillment of the manager's responsibility to the organization. And the, there's a tremendous amount of pressure to, to be quiet and go along, but uh, aside from whatever the right thing to do is, there's also some economic incentive to speak up if you see something going on as a staff member. I think looking at, I don't know whether the audience is, the makeup of the audience has changed since yesterday morning, but there are a fair number of consultants to tax exempt. There's some tax exempt officers. I'm, I imagine, like myself, even though I don't work for a tax exempt, I regularly act as a board member on tax exempt. So there may be reasons for people to be interested, even though their job is not to work for a tax exempt. Yeah, I'd like to pick up on what um, James was talking about in terms of um, you know, structuring pay and how it's going to change going forward. Because um, as we go into the different considerations, whether it's the reasonableness of the compensation structure, like Dan's talking 49.58, or we'll talk <laughs> about 457B and F, um, there's clearly a shift toward a longer-term focus to structuring pay, um, and that serves very valid um, organizational interests from retention to encouraging sustained success on, the, on a future basis. Um, when we start going down the road of um, deferred compensation, um, one thing that's a little tricky is what's called the ERISA top hat rule, and I'll just briefly describe it because we've had organizations that think, gee, this sounds so good that we should be deferring comp. Why don't we do it for all our employees? And the reality is you would create an ERISA disaster if you included more than about 10 to 15% of your highly paid employees in a um, deferred compensation arrangement that involves deferring pay until termination of employment or something like that. So companies or organizations really need to be careful in that respect. Um, one other thing about um, that comes to mind when we look at this very executive type of tap, top hat structure is that rabbi trusts are kind of the flip side or uh, the complement to deferred compensation because the first rabbi trust was formed by um, a synagogue in New York City that wanted to put aside money for a retiring rabbi so that it could be in the bank and paid out during his retirement but not create immediate income. The rabbi trust um, was approved by the IRS, provided that the assets of the trust remain subject to creditors. And as a result, you know, I think that any time you have deferred compensation, a rabbi trust can make a lot of sense because you can seal up money that um, provides assurance of payment in any event short of bankruptcy. Um, but Dan, we've talked about that background, but the real guts of deferred comp and tax exempt orgs is going to come from the 457 BNF, so welcome you. Thank you. I mean, one of the asides is I used to work with a uh, rabbi trust, and the uh, uh, chair of the rabbi trust had, was, had a, uh, was tongue in cheek, and he used to talk about the board of rabbis. <laughs> and uh, his wife happened to be a minister, so there was at least one clergy member, not on the board, but at least one clergy member in, in close uh, proximity. Uh, let's talk about 457B and 457F. Uh, and I'm going to talk about it in very broad strokes because, I mean, I've spent hours uh, talking about it with clients. I've spent a longer period of time talking about it in, a, in isolation. As Mark mentioned earlier, we're covering a lot of ground. Section 457B 
allows for deferral compensation on a vested basis. Unlike 457F and maybe some of the other sections, this one allows you to be vested. Uh, the participants are limited to highly compensated individuals, and there's no statutory definition of HC. There was an old case, probably in the late 70s, early 80s, called Roe Furniture, that counted the top 15%, and forgetting the times, their compensation was like $15,000, $20,000 but yet they were the top 15%. And, and again, forgetting the dollar values between then and now, I mean, the court took it, took, really thought about it hard and took it into account. The current contribution limits are the lesser of 100% of compensation, or for this year, it's 18,500. The limits in 2019 are expected to increase to $19,000. Uh, and you can, uh, I'm sorry, you can have these contributions being all employer, all employee, or some mixture of the two. And we've seen all kinds of arrangements with particularly trade associations and trying to mix and match. Uh, the contributions and earnings are tax deferred. Distributions can be deferred until the year in which the participant reaches 70 and a half and paid over the participant's life expectancy. And one of the things, even though that's true, I mean, I've generally taken a different position with clients. I mean, I've, to the extent clients not only have non-qualified deferred comp, but also have qualified deferred comp, I suggest to them that they use up the non-qualified deferred comp first, because that is not subject to a trust, and it's subject to the general creditors of the organization. So I've had a number of situations where the mostly trade association executives would wind up not taking the distribution until 70 and a half, but burn through their non-qualified money as early on. I mean, there's a little bit tax incentive. There may be some tax disincentive to that, but one of the things I'm always worried about is uh, make sure that you keep your eye on the principal. Uh, tax benefits are great, but if you lose all your money, you may get 100% tax deduction, but that's not the tax deduction you want. Uh, the and, and again, I mean, there are for those of you that are members of associations, even though you may be an association yourself, you're members of associations, or you work with folks who are board members. Uh, a number of associations will actually sponsor those types of organizations. Uh, but the big change between uh, the old days, whatever those are, and today is in the past it was mostly associations sponsoring it with vendors being the service providers today in many instances from what I see, the vendors are actually out in the front lines. I mean, there was at least one insurance company that has a whole office dedicated to non-qualified deferred compensation for trade associate, for non-taxable folks. Uh, let's talk about 457F. 457F plans are also non-qualified deferred compensation for tax-exempt organizations, and there are no dollar limits that can be deferred. The amount deferred under a 457F plan are subject to substantial risk of forfeiture if they're conditioned upon the performance of substantial future services. That's not past services. That's future services. Uh, one of the challenges that I've often had is that the, the uh, temptation for a lot of associations or trade organizations are, okay, uh, this person won't compete. And I've been very conservative for the most part on that. I've generally limited to people who really can control competition. So, for example, in one situation, the exec pretty much uh, controlled the trade fair that was the primary source of income for the year, other than members' dues. So that uh, I really suggest that people test that question as to whether or not there is a not only a theoretical likelihood of competition, but also an, an actual likelihood of competition. And as I mentioned before, my suggestion is that an individual has a choice. A person does not use a 457F plan until he or she exhausts the limit. The limits on the qualified plan does not use a 457F plan. I mean, the, uh, one of the things that I keep suggesting and I may be a bit conservative in that regard, is keep your eye on the principal. Tax benefits are great. It's easy to lose money and get a tax benefit. It's much harder to get a tax benefit and hold on to your money. So uh, one of the things, and I'll talk very briefly about it, but there's, I don't know, um, probably half an inch worth of uh, regulations that were based on June 21st, 2016. The IRS issued proposed regulations covering 457 plans, 
and also applied 409 Cap A rules that applied to 457 uh, plans. I don't believe that those were applicable before that, but the IRS did come out and and take that position. Uh, and I think you're going to talk a little bit more about some of the side benefits under 457F. Uh, one of the things that actually, and I hate, hate to admit it, but uh, I think I'm correct, and it surprised me a little bit, that the proposed regulations have not been finalized yet. Uh, they were both the 457 regulations and the 49 Cap A regulations both apply uh, for private organizations. As I mentioned before, it can make compliance a bit, a bit tricky. And there are situations where uh, the uh, 409 Cap A non-competition rules really do trump the 457 rules. So it is something to take into account carefully, take both sections of the, of the law into account carefully. Uh, I think, bear with me a second. Uh, I think, am I next with excess benefit transaction? No, no, I'll talk sure about 409A for a minute. Okay. Um, I guess I'm on the wrong page. Yeah, for 409A purposes, Dan mentioned it, and you know, it's interesting for tax exempt organizations because you really kind of are caught between two competing regimes where for 457F, um, as soon as there's no substantial risk of forfeiture, there needs to be taxation, where under 409A, if you're thinking only of the regular 409A rules, which involve deferred compensation, it's time of payment rather than time of vesting that's going to dictate um, taxation. So when you're in a tax exempt org, you have to figure out how do those two rules come together and how do you comply with both? Just in a nutshell, what's important on 409A is that this is a rule that came out of Enron to avoid having essentially last minute efforts by executives or companies to pay out deferred compensation and beat the system. So what 409A requires essentially is that you, at the time contracts are entered or deferred compensation elections are made, you need to lock in the time of payment and live with it. And you can't accelerate um, payment except under certain circumstances, and you also have to deal with if you're going to delay a payment date, certain events, in terms of you know minimum requirements for like a five-year delay under 409A. So as a result, when an organization is looking at its executive structures, both 457F and 409A need to be looked at to make sure you don't violate one or the other. The 457F violation generates immediate taxation. The 409A violation results in a 20% penalty on all the amounts paid in violation. So a simple example that would violate 409A, we talk about locking in payment being, the terms of payment being key. If there's a severance arrangement that says, we'll pay you three years of salary and we'll do it either in a lump sum or installments, that's a pure 409A violation. There are exceptions that you can fall within but this imprecision or ambiguity about when payment occurs is the violation amount, and all amounts are potentially subject to the penalty. So, Dan, we've covered that landscape. Now, looking forward, we have a new um, 4960 in the equation, and I think we're going to turn it over to you for that. Sure. 4960 is an interesting provision. Uh, one, the – and I've been involved uh, working with various – organizations on it, and also the firm is part of the UBIC coalition uh, working on it, and uh, presumably there will be a uh, letter going up to um, Congress sometime in the next two weeks. But the whole concept of 4960 is somewhat unique in that at least the folks up on the Hill, and I, I've not been party to too many of those conversations, but at least I've heard about it secondhand, is that it's a fairness issue. If you take a look at the limits that are on or have been on for-profit entities, that there was a limit on a million-dollar comp, and then if, to the extent it was incentive compensation, you could go above a million. This year, they got rid of the issue on incentive compensation. So that 4960 uh, provides us, to the extent that remuneration is paid by an applicable tax exempt for a taxable year with respect to employment in excess of a million dollars plus any excess parachute payment, there will be a tax uh, on the uh, – there will be a tax on the amount paid out. And that uh, the employer – it's the liability is on the employer. It's not on the employee. So you do get a little bit of a tension there between the employee who's saying – 
hey, if, if I'm not responsible for meeting the budget, the more the merrier. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the employer is saying, I don't want to go there. I don't want to pay out non-taxable compensation. I don't know, James, whether you've been involved in some of those conversations on the ground. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, in, you know, and, and I'll just pull back a little bit here uh, to, to comment on 457B plans from our view uh, as comp consultants. It's just great low-hanging fruit for, for an organization to take, take advantage of. Uh, I, I want to emphasize what was said earlier that the organization doesn't have to contribute to the 457B on, on the account of the executive. Uh, and the reason we think these are really attractive is a lot of these executives, especially in our charities, they haven't been earning at high levels for a lot of their career. And we see time and time again uh, executives who aren't adequately set up for retirement. So this is a way uh, of creating a plan where you can get executives in there and give them the opportunity to set aside additional monies or the employer uh, can put in additional monies there for the, the 457B. Uh, so again, I think of it as a, a great tool. Uh, with 457F, you know, when we think about the participation there, more than likely it's going to be limited to your CEO. Um, you know, I'm not going to speak as the attorney in this room, but you know, with this deferring of money to future years that is invested and this commitment, you know, it looks to a person like me like it's almost a contractual commitment in, in a certain way. So for that reason, we see it often limited to the to the CEO. Uh, the interaction with 4960 is, is going to be very fascinating in the next few years because up until this point, a lot of the work we had been seeing, and, and I'll tee it up for you guys, uh, is you know, the CEO and the board were really happy. They, they're getting close to the end of their five-year contract, and vesting was going to hit for the 457F. And they were saying, well, you know what? I don't want to pay these taxes on this right now. I don't want to take a distribution. I'm not near retirement. Can we push it out further? Uh, and there were, there were hoops to jump through. Uh, now we might be seeing other issues now that, you know, we start accumulating these large sums of money. You could be going over that $1 million threshold. So there might be less of a desire to kind of push out vesting, and you might actually see the opposite where you distribute monies in each of the last few years to ensure that you uh, come come beneath that limit. But what have you guys seen in terms of amending these arrangements going forward? And I know the unwinding rules, too, if you want to get out of the 457F uh, game can be a bit tricky as far as impacting more than just that one executive. Okay. The, um can you second my huh? <coughs> One thing that One thing that I've seen that's a bit of an exception to the uh, only the top person is that a number of organizations have an inside CEO and an out or an inside vice president and an outside CEO, and the outside CEO is so busy traveling. Uh, visiting constituents and others and lobbying that the person is really relying very heavily on the day-to-day -day management of the association on the inside person. In that case, I've seen the inside person taking, taking care of very well. Um, the other thing about the I – mean, one of the things that I've, I've seen a number of organizations that have more than – at least one, if not more than one person who's receiving more than a million dollars a comp, although in conversations with – Colleagues, I've been told that there are not that many organizations that really pay more than a million dollars to their CEO. I don't know whether you've seen anything different or not. It, it depends on the subset. Uh, you know, here in D.C., a lot of trade association CEOs, their comp is above a million dollars. And where? Trade association CEOs. Um, professional societies, you know, it, it, it's around, you know, 500 to a million dollars. So you would think that they would keep compensation below a million. Uh, an interesting area to watch in the future is colleges and universities. Uh, a good number uh, of presidents had their compensation go above a million. When those presidents leave, it'll be interesting to see where compensation re resets for them. And the other one you haven't like, mentioned are coaches. Yeah, yeah. I mean, take some of the uh, leading coaches in the U.S. Their comp is well north of ten million, and I don't think I've heard of any being more than twenty million, but well north of ten million. And the and that triggers an interesting thought in my mind because I think of uh, John Harbor, Harbaugh at the University of Michigan. Uh, 
a lot of our clients are like, this can't be the entire universe of deferred comp. You know, a lot of board members come from for-profit uh, experience, and there's got to be other tools. Well, there really aren't that many uh, viable ones, but one that we're seeing a little bit of resurgence on is split dollar life insurance plans. And these arrangements are extremely complicated. Uh, the IRS revised the rules around them in the, the early 2000s, and uh, because they got uh, tighter regulations on them, they fell out of favor. But now you're seeing them come back into play, and you know, from my perspective, uh, we, we think about it from the executive mindset of, you know, how do they view these benefits? Honestly, these benefits are often so complicated that the, the executive doesn't really understand what, what they're getting and doesn't really assign a dollar value to it. Uh, so in that sense, you know, if you're going to pay a benefit to any employee, especially your executive, you want them to recognize the value of it. Um, so I would always be hesitant myself with the split dollar policies, but they are becoming more popular. Is that what you guys are seeing? Much earlier in my career, I did a lot of work with split dollar policies. And one of the things that we found was that to the extent that an executive can borrow cash value, particularly the policies were designed with large amounts of cash value, that to the extent they could borrow cash value, they could actually monetize it. I mean, the question is how to pay it back at some point, and, and would the association then forgive the loans, and then you get the question whether it was a bona fide loan. Uh, how, who are the covered employees? I mean, they're taking a little bit of step backwards, but it's the five highest compensated employees. And one of the things that's different about this rule than other rules that I'm aware of is that it's the five highest compensated uh, employees of the organization for the taxable year or was a covered employee of the organization any predecessor for any preceding taxable year beginning after December 31, 2016. So you could very well have a number of uh, people that may not be the top five or may be bouncing. So you may have a fair number more than what one would expect in this category. Yeah, one thing that's intriguing to me as we talk about 4960 is kind of James indicated, you know, this idea that, um, an organization needs to start forecasting, you know, where they are today and then where the pay structures are going to be in the future, both in terms of, you know, existing deferred compensation or contractual commitments, then who's going to be coming down the pipeline and, you know, be in a position to manage um, the, the tax timing on a going forward. Um, you know, it's interesting because in a way it reminds me a little bit of the for-profit 162M where companies that are blowing through the limit just they live with going through the limit, and it's like a cost of doing business. So I think when you're talking about these coaches or the people well north of a million dollars, it's just a cost of doing business. But when you're looking at the packages that are south of a million dollars or could trip over it, high dollars become at stake in terms of how you do this planning at this moment in time. And, and the optics are just not very good. Uh, you know, the, that's the other thing is, as a board member or an executive, uh, anyone tasked with managing this, uh, you've always got to be mindful of optics. Uh, the idea of paying an excise tax makes people stop and why are we paying this? You know, they think there must have been a way for us to avoid it. Uh, you know, it's the same idea of the psychology when competition goes above a half a million dollars. Uh, when it goes above a million dollars, that newspaper article picks up that much more page views. Uh, so uh, I, I think all of that com comes back together. Uh, one last piece, go ahead. No, no, I. One last piece I wanted to note on 457Fs. Uh, we've seen a lot of recent push from executives that, okay, I'm willing to subject this money to forfeiture, I'm willing to defer it out to later, so I'm taking on risk. But in addition to accruing these large amounts of money, I'd like you to uh, apply interest growth to it. Um, and that creates a, a set of complexities because uh, 457Fs, you know, at one level people were always hesitant to adopt them. But they can be quite simple in application. You can drop it into provisions into an employment agreement. Um, you don't need necessarily a standalone document. It can be tracked, the amount, basically by, you know, a ledger uh, bookkeeping. Uh, employers don't need to set aside money for it. But the second you start applying interest to these accounts, it, it creates a little bit more complexity and uh, 
I don't know if you guys been seeing, you know, additional wrinkles like that with the 457s. Well, I think what you're raising is really important because, you know, we think about a risk of forfeiture as being something that's, um, you know, avoided at all costs in terms of a risk to an executive. But under the 457F and the 409A rules, you know, you can have a risk of forfeiture that's, you know, termination for cause, um, or I mean termination without cause would be a vesting event, for cause would be forfeiture, and then resignation um, without good reason would be, um, you know, um, a forfeiture event, but resignation for good reason, like a change in material change in responsibilities or reduction in pay would be a, a vesting event. So you can put together a provision that's, to me, workable in the, you know, and palatable to an executive in order to put the money in a way that, um, you know, is in line with the 457F rules and long-term planning. And just to move along so we can get to the other two slides, let me pick up just a couple of aspects, one of which is that uh, amounts of, from a 457F plan that have to be included income are, are included in this number. One of the things that I've done a lot over the years is taken executives, particularly relatively young executives, and used five-year tranches on vesting. Because what is the likelihood that a 35-year-old might make it to 65 in an organization? And you don't want, at least I, as uh, I'd often counsel the executives rather than the organization. I mean, I didn't want to see the person at risk for the next 35 years. So I'd say uh, split, split the situation, vest out five years, six years, ten years, take your money, you'll pay taxes, but at least you know you have the money, you have the balance. I, I think five to six years makes sense. Uh, we'll talk about it a little later on. That matches a lot of contract terms. Uh, it also, depending on the common amount, can keep you below the, the $1 million threshold. So that, that's certainly what we're seeing. Uh, you don't want it to be necessarily two years because it's, you know, why go through this effort for right. something that, that's so short term? Let me, again, briefly cover two other pieces. One is that uh, to the extent that the association controls other organizations, those that compensation would get included and that excess parachute payments would also get included. One of the things that I'll touch about, hopefully no more than 30 or 40 seconds, is that uh, this year for the first time, there's an unrelated business income tax on qualified transportation fringe benefits under Section 4, 512A7. It could apply to parking. There are also organizations that require uh, transportation benefits to be handed out to employees, whether they want them or not. So there is a coalition going on uh, under the UBIT coalition trying to uh, either postpone it, modify it, but try to do something that's viable to help uh, people out. And anyway, let me throw it back to Yeah, why don't we go to the next frame, and James can uh, lead us into the board dynamic discussion. Yeah, and I'm going to go through this at a high level. The the, the idea here is I, I wanted to speak to kind of the interplay with the, the, the governance and who should be involved with the, these comp decisions. Uh, you know, at some level, every board member has a fiduciary duty, so there, there needs to be a touch point there. But the, the practical application is that we generally see this as held by an executive committee of the board that then reports out to the full board for up and down votes. Uh, an executive committee is frankly just a lot more manageable. You know, it's usually three to five individuals. Uh, those executive committee members are generally, you know, the most familiar with the organization and the executive's performance. So it, it's a good roster to work from. Uh, also with executive committees, there's usually a set stable rotation. Uh, so, you know, there's usually a past president, president, president-elect, uh, maybe some kind of treasurer. Or, so there creates that stability, which is a good thing with compensation. Because one thing we haven't touched on is the performance piece of this. And, you know, what we see from, as a management consultant, one of the worst things is this. Uh, that committee evaluating the president and determining compensation is yo-yoing back and forth from priorities. Uh, having that set kind of rotation is a, is a good for stability and institutional memory with what you're doing. Just quickly, one thing I wanted to note, you know, years ago we saw a really big drive towards creating a specific comp committee to handle compensation. I've actually seen a pullback now, and, and mostly it's the executive committees now acting as the comp committee. 
just for the reasons I mentioned earlier, that you know, generally they're the most familiar with the performance metrics and the needs of the organization, so they're well positioned to take this on. They also speak with a, a strong voice and authority that is usually set up very well to get broader board approval. Um, Do you see a need for a charter in those contexts? I, I think there is. I think there absolutely is to the, the point that, you, you know, the charter, in our view, creates that institutional memory, so there's less guessing. People know their roles and what they're supposed to do. But that's a great segue to what we rarely see people knowing their role is with how do they evaluate other executives below the CEO? You know, what is the roles board with assessing their compensation? Certainly, if they're subject to 4958, uh, you know, they, they need to make sure compensation is reasonable. But how much do boards get involved in, you know, what the base salary adjustment should be based on the performance? What should that bonus be based on? And I've seen CEOs get so frustrated because board members have their pet executives that they work with. Uh, and that creates a lot of tension. So that, that's something that everyone who's involved in that wants to create clear lines and consistency year over year. You know, what is expected of the CEO to report out on the executives uh, and kind of what is their purview of, of the board with respect to that. One of the things that I've seen over the years is executives having contracts that say that they'll have sole authority with regard to the, those people who, who are in lesser positions. The, board or a committee can can suggest, and there may be uh, uh, not only reputation risk, but uh, career risk by not listening, but nonetheless, they do insist on, on unilateral uh, power. Yeah, I've had, I've had a lot of conversations where uh, someone's almost pounding on the table that the board has one employee, and that's, that's, that's me as the CEO and the rest are, uh, but, you know, the, there needs to be some political wisdom there and, and recognizing that the boards do have a real responsibility. So. How do you manage manage that? And uh, uh, I think Dan, you were going to talk about the, the tax consideration managing tax. Consideration. Let me pick up the next two aspects very quickly so that we can get do justice to the last slide, and that's uh, support from consultants outside counsel. I mean, the ideal situation is that there's a partnership. Uh, if you're excluded or, or shunned as counsel, maybe your life isn't very long for that organization. And then also managing tax law considerations. I mean, the, uh, we talked a fair bit about it, and, I, and I'll emphasize a point I made before. Uh, I keep emphasizing keep your eye on the money. Uh, taxes, if you make money, paying taxes is not terrible. It's far better to pay taxes and make the, having made the money than not paying taxes and having somehow lost the money. So with that, I'll turn it over. At, I don't know who's... Uh, I'll build from Dan's thought because um, one thing we talked about, James Ray's, is... is you know, to add um, deferred compensation, whether it's 457B or F, doesn't have to involve a long document or, you know, a labored process. It can be provisions within an agreement. But at the same time, um, as Dan mentioned, outside counsel and special advice, I think that highlights how important it is because we were saying before we got on that, you know, how often do you see an agreement that just says, you'll be, we'll credit 50000 to the executive's account and he'll be fully vested and he'll be paid out of termination of employment, which is just a big problem um, under 457F right. because there's no substantial risk of forfeiture behind it. They also so, be a problem under 457B as well. Right, exactly. So, I mean, now I, I'm, uh, and every situation is different, but I, to the extent that I have any interest in it or ability to, to sway the, the scale, I, I would vote for a separate uh, agreement, even though it has more words to it. Uh, I, I joke that I often uh, wear belt and suspenders and hold my pants up. I, I, like, I like certainty to the extent I can get it. Well, uh, we'll add some certainty and we'll go to the next frame. Okay. <laughs> more practical applications. Um, James? Yeah, you know, I just wanted to cover some of the, the things that we see with these executive agreements. Uh, again, years ago, we saw executive CEOs negotiating three- to four-year agreements. Uh, well, with how expensive and time-consuming searches are, and, and with the, the deferred comp, the need to layer this on to be more competitive, uh, boards are asking for a little bit more uh, back, and now we're seeing five- to six-year uh, arrangements, and that's also attractive to CEOs who are looking for a little bit more stability. Uh, granted, these are not baseball contracts, so they're not guaranteed for, you know, that six-year term, but uh, we are seeing that the length increase. 
Uh, and at the same time, we've seen severance kind of settle around 12 months of pay for the CEO. I use pay a little bit vaguely there purposefully because uh, depending on the comp arrangement, it might just be 12 months salary, it might be 12 months salary plus a target bonus. Um, and then for executives below the CEO, we see severance of about three to nine months, not in a contract, but as, as far as a, a payout after the fact in, in exchange for a release. Uh, of claims. Um, I'll, I'll just add that from the lawyer side. James noted something that so often gets overlooked in a grievance, which is to make sure that if you're going to pay severance, at the front end, you have a right to get a release of claims, um, a general release, before you ever pay anything. And, and from our perspective, we, this goes back to, this links up nicely with the 4958, you know, for us, we treat severance as separate from regular compensation, and severance is generally reasonable for our opinion letters if it's in line with market practice, which, you know, about 12 months, maybe in some context up to 24, uh, but that the association or the nonprofit is getting something back in return, and that's a release of claims. Um, so that, that's how we think of it. One of the other things that I've uh, seen over the years, and I'm curious what both of your uh, thoughts are, is with regard to whether a six-year contract is really a six-year contract or it's a series of a year or two years or six months, because the typical severance that I've been seeing recently is six months to a year. And forgetting whether or not there's a minimum period so somebody moves, they don't wind up uh, three weeks later getting, getting fired and having disrupted their lives for nothing, so there tends to be a little bit front-end loading sometimes. But uh, I generally, I rarely see severance agreements over a year unless it's either very strong exec or a very long-term exec. Yeah, I, I think we would agree with that uh, entirely, and I think it's interesting, the idea of these longer agreements, five to six years, but usually with respect to base salary, there's no set escalation. It's generally that it's at the board's discretion. It'll evaluate market movement, um, performance, and the financial feasibility of the organization. Well, I've had some board chairs come to me and it's like, you know, Jesus, it seems like we're renegotiating every year <laughs> with the, the executive because we have to reset the, the salary. So, uh, you know, there is some stability with that six-year agreement, but when your severance is limited, when you're – Kind of reviewing salary each year sometimes it doesn't feel like it yeah james you know one thing that um you mentioned a little while ago that i think we'll go back to is the building and the performance goals um and how you're seeing that develop because you know what, what you just described to me is this transitioning to better practices which we see everywhere which you know in many times involves an agreement that might have been market five years ago but whether the severance is too long or the, um, the structures are too generous and the, com and the organization from a board side that's getting more active needs to make some change, you know, I think the, when the pendulum swings too far, you've kind of um, created disincentives for, and unhappiness at the executive levels. And so it's a real art to put together a move toward best practices that, also, that it isn't a lose-lose from the executive perspective. And I was thinking, how do you put the performance in there to, to create that situation? Can I also expand that a little bit? I don't know whether yeah. we talked about non-competes and non-solicits. How do they all fit into all of these things? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, with the, the non-competes and non-solicits, uh, we often see the non-solicitation. Um, sometimes we'll see non-competes in the nonprofit arena. Uh, especially if it's, uh, you know, a specific business line that that association is in, a specific convention, something that they're, they're afraid of. We don't see that much of a focus on it, but, you know, as a board, it's a good starting point for negotiations, and you can always evaluate whether uh, that's needed or not. The, the performance piece that, that Mark teed up, I think, is, is critical. And, the, the first answer I give of when is the right time to kind of reemphasize performance is usually when you hire that next CEO. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a time to, to, to wipe the, the slate clean. I will say there is a perception that, you know, with a new CEO, you can reset compensation at a lower level. Unfortunately, that new CEO is operating from a position of negotiating where they've looked at your 990 and know what you were paying the prior one. Uh, but that is certainly a, a, an avenue where 
boards are just not willing to go above certain salary limits. And, and if they're going to add compensation, they're going to add it in other ways. Maybe it is in base salary adjustments, but there's a performance piece. Maybe it's in a bonus limit. We've seen a lot more bonus plans worth a lot more in the nonprofit space. Uh, and frankly, the performance piece is what's needed to justify compensation to new board members. So uh, a lot of the work we're doing now is in performance management. How do you take, you know, association goals and convert it to metrics and a scorecard that can be evaluated by board members who aren't here day to day seeing everything? And, and that's where we're, we're seeing a lot of our work of letting the executive paint the picture of how they did. You know, it's not just about the perspective planning of these were my goals at the beginning and the year. It's what happened during the year, what threats arose, what opportunities, and how did I shift our organization's resources to, to address that. And that's how you should evaluate me uh, as an executive when I look at the, the whole performance. But um, to the point of this slide, it's these nonprofits have gotten to a level with scrutiny and comp levels where there needs to be good practices and diligence that are in some ways reflecting what the for-profit market was already doing, you know, performance management, non-competes, non-solicitation. Peer data. Peer data, exactly. What was that? Peer data, you know, okay. market data. Last frame? Yeah, we're almost at the top of the hour. Um, it's interesting. Um, I'll welcome Dan. Do you have any final comments you'd like to raise or James? Um, I guess the, um, I mean, and it's really somewhat on the final slide that um, onboarding is, a lot of people pay a lot of attention to onboarding. They don't pay as much attention to termination, and I don't know if there's a term called offboarding, but the retiring executive, I think that needs as much attention for people on the way out, forgetting the automatic firing because somebody was malfeasance, but just the fact you have a 35-year executive who's getting ready to leave. How do you deal with finding a new person when everybody has known the old execs since they were uh, young college graduates? I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I think that that's something that people need to pay attention to as well. And I'll cede my re remaining time to Mark <laughs> for the unifying theory and uh, all the grounds we covered today. You're right. Well, I think we should go full circle. If you can go back to the first frame, Shalom, um, because on that first frame, um, to me, you'll, you'll see our contact information and phone numbers. Um, you know, we, we hope you've heard, um, you know, heads up for things to watch. Um, you know, James, thank you so much for bringing your expertise here, and we, you'll, your email and phone number are there, and um, Dan and I are appreciative of your time and those who called in. So thanks for joining this Wagner Law webinar today. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.